Calling All Cars, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Diego Police calling all cars, Benton All Cars, Broadcast 7. Starting a holdup and murder on the National City site. Bandits wearing tan coveralls, dark glasses, and driving a black Ford Roadster without a windshield. He's men are armed, so be careful. That's all. hundreds of radio-equipped police cars prowling about your city every hour of the day and night. Would you risk your reputation by letting ordinary gasoline slacken the speed and cut down the power of your emergency car? Or would you select the finest gasoline money could buy so your police cars could answer emergency calls at top speed so they could catch any criminal getaway car in a chase? Many of your brother police chiefs would advise you that Rio Grande Cracks Gasoline has the reputation in police circles of being the fastest, most efficient gasoline made. The police chiefs of Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, or Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties use Rio Grande Cracks Gasoline exclusively because it comes as close as possible to perfect performance. Yet, it fits expense budgets. For the cost records of these cities show year after year that Rio Grande Crack gasoline delivers more miles as well as faster miles from every gallon. Every motorist can get this same gasoline that powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand from the independent Rio Grande dealer in your neighborhood. Ask for Rio Grande Crack and enjoy the thrill of police car performance in your car. now our pleasure to present Mr. W. A. Huggins on the staff of Chief Sears of the San Diego Police Department. Mr. Huggins. Every man who plots a holdup or some other crime invariably thinks he is smart enough to get away with it. He knows that in crimes committed in the past, the law has captured the criminals in practically every case, but always he is going to be the exception. We have confronted scores of lawbreakers captured by our police officers and always they're baffled at the ease with which we tracked them down and blew up their alibis. They marvel at the apparent uncanny ability shown by the police in singling the right man out of the many who might have committed the crime. The secret of our success is simply that we take advantage of the mistakes every lawbreaker makes. Carefully as he plans his crime, there's always some detail he overlooks. Our job is simply to discover these mistakes and use common sense. There are always one or more clues to lead us to the criminals. The case you will now hear, for example, was carefully planned and daringly executed. But the holdup men made plenty of mistakes. They were not smart robbers. They were stupid. All criminals are stupid. The story that follows is proof that crime cannot pay. Shortly after midnight, in the middle of May 1929, two shadowy figures stealthily work at the lock of the service entrance of a Ford agency in San Diego. How you coming? Uh, none of these keys seem to fit. That's funny. Well, here's the last one. I'll try it. Nope. Hey, give me that hammer. What are you going to do? I'm going to bust this padlock open. Oh, you're nuts. You'll wake up the whole town. Ah, listen. We're getting in there, ain't we? I don't care how we do it. Yeah, but maybe somebody will hear us. Well, if anybody comes snooping around, just get them. I'll take care of them. Go on, give me that hammer. Well, all right. Here you are. Swell. Here goes. Yeah. 
That's more like it. Hmm, did the business all right? Sure, they did the business. That's the way to get things done. Force, my boy. There once was a mug that lived in the old days by the name of Alexander the Great. He found that out. When he couldn't untie a knot, he cut it with his sword. Yeah? Well, let's drop the history lesson and get into this joint. Here, give me a hand on this door. Sure there's no watchman here? I told you I cased the joint, didn't I? Yeah. Well, you heard me. There ain't no watchman. Okay. Hey, douse that flashlight, will you? Do you want to invite the whole world to this party? But how can you see what you want? Ah, the street light shines right through the showroom good enough, don't it? You're going to take a new car? Sure. Right off the floor. Yeah, but that's taking a chance. They can spot a new car. Not when we get through with it. Ah, I think it'd be a better idea to take one of these into service. If ah, I'm... listen, dummy. They wouldn't be there if it was running good, would they? No. Uh, we've got to be sure we got a good car. Well, here we are. What looks good to you? Well, how about that coop over there? Nah. Uh, I think we better take that roadster. Oh, that's too flashy. Well, we'll fix that. You see, we can drop the windshield on the roadster and shoot straight ahead. If we take a coop, we'd have to take that windshield out. And that might attract attention. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, come on, hop in. She got gas? Careful with that light. Yeah, she's quarter full. Let's have those four keys of yours. Okay, here you are. Find one to fit? Yeah, here it is. Okay, let's go. San Diego for the stolen car, Cochran and Colton are working on it in the garage back of their bungalow. Finally, after two days of secret activity, they pridefully view the result of their labor. Hmm, that's a big difference from the shiny gray job we drove off to Florida the other night, eh, Marty? Yeah. Nobody could call it a professional paint job, but it's just what we want. Hmm, and that rotten black paint makes it look like any number of other heaps around the town. Oh, say, listen... Don't you think we'd better put some damp rags on the headlights and radiator so they'll rust? Yeah, that's a good idea. Now, listen. The way I figure is this. That wide stretch of road along the National City Dyke is the best place to pull a job. Yeah, there's not much traffic there. What time does the money car come to? Well, it leaves Caliente in time to get to the bank in town here around noon. Hmm. So it'll come along and, well, about, about 11.30. And we'll knock over on Monday, you see, you know, when they're bringing in the tape for the weekend. Figure we'll have much trouble with the Mex guards? Nah, there's only two of them. They bring the dough over in a coop. They've never been knocked over before, have they? Nah, that's why they're so careless, I guess. But if they get tough, why, we'll just bump them off. Oh, gee, we don't have to do that, do we? Might. What of it? Ain't a hundred grand worth of beef? Yeah, I guess so. But... Remember that mug, Alexander? He had the right idea. Cut right through the knot. morning of May 20th, 1929, Nemesio Monroy and J.V. Barrigo, two Mexican police officers, call at the Agua Caliente Casino for the weekend receipt. Well, here it is, boys. How much dinero we take today, boss? Almost a hundred grand. What is the deal? A hundred thousand dollars? Oh, oh. Make a nice present for my woman and me, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it would. But don't you go waltzing off with that dough, or I'll beat your ears in the mess. <laughs> oh, do not worry. <laughs> By the way, how is your wife? Oh, pretty good. Will not be long now before we have another little one. Is that so? You're acquiring quite a family in the mess. Oh, see, see. Four already, all boys. And soon it will be five. <laughs> <laughs> the mess He's raising his own army for the next revolution. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better get started with the dough, boys. See, si, muy pronto. Adios, senor. Goodbye, boys. Parked on a side street from which they can see far up the highway along the National City Dyke, Cochran and Colson await their victims. 
ignorant of their peril they are approaching, laughing and joking as they drive through Tijuana, bumping along the dirt road to the customs gate. They pass over the line, through San Isidro, and on into National City. Hey, it's 11.30. Maybe we missed them. Yeah, how could we? We've been here since 8 o'clock this morning. But well, maybe they went the other way, through Chula Vista. Hey, listen. I tell you, this is the route they take. You don't think I'd go into this thing before I checked every angle, do you? Well, no. Hey, but... that looks like them now. Yeah. See that big coop coming down the road? Yeah. Yep, them's the boys. All right, kick that motor over. Okay. All right. Go over there and get in right behind them. Boy, oh boy, what a break this is, eh? Not another car in sight. Swell. Not just like this. Keep that distance behind them while I turn this heater on them. There you are. That pulled them over all right. Hey, just a minute. Just a minute. What's the matter? This tomcat's jammed. Wait till I clear it. Ah, darn it. All right, there it is. Okay, let's go. You take that side and I'll take this one. Come on now. Hurry. Hey, sir, what do you men want from us? All right, boys. Hand over that dough. Caramba, what's the big idea of shooting it up? Let him have it, Lee. Let him have it. Shut up, Marty. Shut up. Let him have it, I say. Oh, oh, What's you're... the matter, Marty? Oh, you darn fool. You didn't have to hit me, did you? Yeah, I'm sorry, Marty. Well, it could have been worse. Oh, you only got me in the arm. There's the satchel. Come on, grab it. Okay. Now to duck these overalls and dark glasses and get me to a doctor. Gee, Marty, it was a crying shame to bump off those poor devils. Hey, what are you bawling about? You nearly murdered me, didn't you? Oh, well, it wasn't necessary to kill those guys. They didn't have a chance. You remember that mug Alexander the Great? He turned on the heat first and talked afterwards. <laughs> Detective Bureau, Sergeant Kelly speaking. Yeah? Where? On the National City Dike. Yeah? Okay. Be right out. What's up? Murder, O'Connor. Come on. Now, did any of you people see this happen? Uh, no, 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 sir, no, sir, that is, uh, uh, yes. Well, now, which do you mean? Well, well you see, me, me and my friend George, uh, when we was over there in the dumps and we done here the shooting. Well, what did the men look like that did the shooting? Uh, well, I, I couldn't exactly tell, Mr. Uh, what do you mean you couldn't tell? Did you see them? Well, sir, I, I did, and again, I didn't know. Well, what do you mean? Well, well sir, you, you see, when when these here now bullets started whizzing around, why... Well, George and me, we, we just naturally hid under some tin roof until it was all over. Well, didn't you see anything? Well, I, I done saw them drive away. How many were there? Well, the, the two. That, that's all I see. What were they dressed like? Well, I don't take no particular notice. Uh, seems like they had on these here now jumper things like the garage mechanic wear. Anything else? Well, sir, let me see now. If I, if I just remember correctly, they... They had on them uh, sunglasses. Did you get their license number? No, sir. I wasn't paying no notice to the license number about that time. Well, what kind of a car were they in? Well, it seemed to me like it was uh, an old Ford. A Ford? What color? Well, uh, kind of dark, I guess. Uh, a black, maybe. Anything else? Well, I think that's about all I know. Anyone else see this happen? Maybe your friend George saw something else. George? Oh, no, sir. George, he, he didn't see nothing. Oh, we want to talk to him. Where is he? George? <laughs> uh, George, he's still hiding under that tin roof and over in the dump. Meager are the clues the police have on which to work. Old black boards are under suspicion, but finding the right one is as easy as finding the proverbial lost needle. Things look black for the police when help comes from an unexpected source. Well, this is a tough one. Yeah, it sure is. Two guys dressed in jumpers and dark glasses and an old Ford. Hmm. I'll find a hundred people answering that description in a half an hour. Yeah, and you won't be any closer to the right one. That's right. 
Detective Bureau, Sergeant Kelly speaking. This is the investigation Yeah? Well, I have some information that uh, might be of assistance to you. Yeah? What's that? Well, a couple of men drove up near my house about noon today in an old Ford. Yes? Well, they uh, met by another car which, uh, well, took them away. Uh, one of them uh, seemed to be wounded. The Ford still parked in the suite. What's the address, Mr. Hartel? Thanks. We'll be right out. Now, what did these men look like, Mr. Hartel? Well, uh, they were both about uh, 25 years old. One was around uh, five feet, five inches tall, and uh, the other one was uh, maybe two inches taller. Uh, how were they dressed? Oh, head on some old clothes. Could and... you identify them if you saw them again? Absolutely. Well, here's hoping you get a chance to. Well, let's have a look at this car. Hmm. Dealer's license. Is that number on your hot sheet, O'Connor? Well, uh, let's see. Yeah. That's the number of the car stolen from the Ford Agency last week. But this is an old Ford. The one that was stolen was a new car. Oh, just a minute. Well, this is a new car, too. Take a look at the position of the brake and gear shift. Well, this is a new car. Painted over, huh? Sure. Hey, wait a minute. What's this? What? Something stuffed into the corner under the brake pedal. Well. The jumpers and the dark glasses. Well, uh, what's that mean, hey? That means this is the car the murderers used, Mr. Hartel. murder remains a mystery. Although Kelly and O'Connor have a slight description of the criminals, they have nothing definite to go on. But the fact that a machine gun was used starts them on an inquiry among underworld characters. Well, Kelly, I got a lead. You have? What yeah, I found out that Ted Barnes has a submachine gun. Or at least, he did have one a week ago. Ted Barnes? Oh, yes, he's that bootlegger up the line, isn't he? Yeah, that's the guy. But as I remember him, he, he doesn't fit the description of these mugs. He's about six feet tall, and he's fat. The guys that did this job were both short. They were young fellas, too. Sure, that's right. But Barnes might have lent them his machine gun, mightn't he? Yeah. Well, it won't hurt to go up there and look Barnes' joint over. Okay, let's do that. search warrant, Kelly and O'Connor follow up this latest elusive clue, more than sure that it will end nowhere. Mighty quiet around here. I'll be prepared for anything. This Barnes is a bad egg. Here comes somebody. Well, what is it? We want to see Ted. He isn't here. Where is he? Out. Well, we'll uh, we'll come in and wait for him. You can't do that. I don't know when he'll be back. We'll come in just the same. Say, what's the big idea? Who are you? We're police officers. Oh, yeah? Yeah. See that? That buzzer don't mean anything. This is a private house, and you can't come in without a warrant. Well, we thought of that. Here's the warrant. Oh. Well, I... Come on, Kelly. Oh, I see you've got a hospital here. What's that? Look, there's a guy in bed over there in the corner. Keep your hands off that gap, mister. I got you covered. Get that automatic out of his reach, Kelly. Right. What's your name, pal? What's the matter with you? You won't talk, yeah? Well, I'll take a look. What's the matter with him, Kelly? Bullet wound in his arm. This looks like our man. Who is this guy? I ain't saying nothing. Well, you're Barnes' wife, aren't you? Yeah. Well, where is he? I don't know. So he and this bird held up the money car. And he ducked out and left you to care for his pal, eh? That's a lie. Well, that's the way it looks to me. Ted didn't have a thing to do with no hold-up. What about this man here? Who is he? Let him tell you. Did he hold up the money car? I don't know nothing about it. Well, we'll have to arrest you, too. What for? Well, we'll book your friend here on suspicion of murder, and we'll book you on... You uh... can't arrest me. I ain't done a thing. Looks to me like you're an accessory after the fact. At least that's the way we're going to arrest you. <laughs> Hartel positively identifies the wounded man as one of the two he saw leave the Ford two days before. 
Police cover the town and discover the bungalow court in which an apartment was taken by Joseph Renanay, who answers the wounded man's description. However, the facts discovered in the apartment identify Renanay as one Marty Colson, an ex-convict on parole, after serving part of a sentence on an arson charge committed in Los Angeles County. Papers in the apartment show that his partner is one Lee Cochran. Mrs. Barnes is the important link in the chain of suspects. Police question her closely. Now, look here, Mrs. Barnes. We've got this case just about so up. Yes, it isn't going to do you any good to hold out on us. Listen, I don't know anything about it. Now, that's not true, Mrs. Barnes. It is true. I don't know a thing. Now, we know that Ted wasn't in on this job. What are you trying to do, trap me? Why, of course not. You told us yourself he had nothing to do with it. And that's true, isn't it? Sure, it's true. But Marty Colson, the man you were caring for in your house yesterday, he was on the job. I don't know. How did you find out his name? Oh, never mind. And uh, Lee Cochran and his pal was the other bandit. We know that. So, Marty Cochran, eh? Looks like it. Said he wouldn't open his mouth. Now, look here, Mrs. Barnes, you're the woman. Did you know that one of those poor Mexican officers who was murdered the other day left a wife that was about to have a baby? Uh, is that the truth? On the level. Oh, we know Ted didn't do the job, but we want to get Cochran. We want to see some sort of justice done. We can't give that poor Mexican woman back her husband, but at least we can make Cochran pay for the penalty of his crime. Now, if you were in that poor woman's place, and if Ted had been murdered, you'd want to see justice done now, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I would. All right. You can help us. Oh, we want Cochran. Where did he go? Well, I think he went up to L.A. He and Ted. Oh, I mean he... Oh, so Ted is with him, huh? Listen, you said you wanted Cochran... I ain't talking about Ted. I got constitutional rights. You can't make me testify against my husband. Furnished with a description of Cochran and Barnes, the sheriff's office of Los Angeles County takes the two men into custody within 24 hours. For more than two months, while they were awaiting trial and all through the courtroom proceedings, Colson refused to talk. He makes the communications that are necessary in writing. But from the moment of his arrest to the moment when he stands before the judge to receive his sentence, Silent Marty, as he has come to be called, has never uttered a word. Martin Colson, Lee Cochran, you've heard the jury's verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Before I sentence you, have you anything to say? Nothing to say. I suppose it is useless to ask you, Martin Colson, if you want to break the silence you have obstinately maintained throughout the trial. No, Judge. I have got something to say. Before you sentence me, I've got something important to say, Your Honor. I want to die. I want to pay my debt to society. Let me go, Judge. I'm the one you want. I planned the whole thing. Hang me, Judge, and let my partner go. But Colson's magnanimous offer is refused, and he and Cochran are both sentenced to life imprisonment in Folsom Prison. Ted Barnes is sentenced to a year in the county jail as an accomplice after the fact. In Folsom, Martin Colson retains his grim silence, only rarely talking to his fellow prisoners. His nickname of Silent Marty follows him behind the grim gray walls of the northern prison. Desperate, morbidly brooding, Colson determines to beat the raft. For months, he works secretly on a crude diving apparatus, and then one day he attempts to escape through the powerhouse water intake pipe into the prison moat. But his apparatus fails to function, and he is dragged from the moat half drowned. He serves a hitch in solitary for his attempted break. But as soon as he's back in the cell block, he and his cell mate set about fashioning two pistols from the bits of metal they conceal in the machine shop. Then, on the morning of February 27, 1933, as the men are marching to their daily task. All set, pal. Right. Oh, what's the matter, Marty? Oh. Keep going there. What's holding up the line? My pal here. Stay. Come on, don't go. Oh, quit prodding me, will you? 
Oh, on the up and up. I got cramps up. You better let me take him to the hospital. Okay, Paul. Work like a charm. Yeah, but you better keep on looking. Hey. Now, you hold up the guard in the hospital. Yeah. And I'll make the operator call the warden down here. Yeah. If anybody gets fancy, bump a ball. You know what that means if they catch us? Sure, I do. But remember that mug, Alexander the Great, right through the knot. Okay, okay. Here we are. You all set? Let's go. What do you want? Oh. My partner here, sick. Oh. Come this way, and then we will. All right, grab his gun. Okay. I'll get the operator. Okay. What are you? Shut up, you. Don't ask no questions. Call the warden and tell him to come down here right away. Tell him it's important. But look here. Of course I tell you, will you? Or you're breathing your last this minute. Oh, all right. Hello, warden. This is the hospital. Can you come down right away? One of the men is very sick. Yes, it's important. Please all hurry. All right, that's enough, that's enough. You don't have to cry over the telephone. Don't touch that board. It's hot, I say. I'll get into that other room. The warden comes? Yeah. Guy here nearly tipped us off, but it's okay. The warden tried to call back. When he doesn't get an answer, he'll think that guy's awful sick and he'll be down on the double. Good. Then he'll listen to us. He'll hand over the keys and give us a safe conduct out of this hole. Yeah, yeah. He ain't got no guts. Wardens never have. Ah. It's strong guys like us. Yeah. Like that Alexander mug that gets places in this world. Yeah. You bet I'm telling you, pal. Listen. What's that? The prison siren there. Why? Where are you going? They'll never get me. Okay, okay, you win. Where's your pop? He won. I guess he shot himself. He said you'd never get him. Gee, and he was a swell guy, too. Lots of education. Say, do any of you guys know who this mug Alexander is he was always talking about? thought he was smart enough to beat the law. He died a victim of his own stupidity. Any man who thinks he is smart enough to beat the law is mentally unbalanced. Common sense will convince any intelligent person that the forces of law and order are too strongly organized. Let tonight's story of criminal folly serve as a warning to any criminally minded listener that you can't get away with it. The time-worn old slogan is today truer than ever. Crime does not pay. Thank you, Mr. Huggins. If you like these radio crime dramas, you'll be interested in reading the Calling All Cars News. This month's issue illustrates 15 free gifts for boys and girls. Get this unique publication free wherever Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline is sold. And wherever you find Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline, you'll find Sinclair Motor Oils, too. These independent dealers know that Sinclair has pioneered most of the refinements recently announced by other oil companies. It was Sinclair who perfected the de-waxing and de-jellying processes to purify motor oil. Modern high-compression engines need Sinclair motor oil to ensure continuous lubrication of those fast-moving, finely fitted parts. As one of the world's largest makers of lubricants, Sinclair engineers work with every automotive manufacturer to develop perfect lubricants. The manufacturer of your car has specified a Sinclair oil or lubricant for every moving part. And your Rio Grande Cracks gasoline dealer is equipped to give you this Sinclair scientific lubrication. San Diego Police calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 7. Starting a hold up and murder on the National City Dike. Back this case now in custody. That's all. Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.